They did such a good job. What an amazing story. And hey everyone, uh, I am Pastor Jonathan Roberts. Uh, today I want to share with us in our few moments together uh, 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 some key thoughts uh, this Christmas. You know, as I was watching and I was preparing today for this drama, uh, there's a powerful message that is stated behind this drama. If we look at this drama and we, we kind of reflect of what's going on, we see a lot of key things that's happening, right? We see a family that is wealthy at the start. They are living in luxury. Uh, they, are good, they are in a good place to be in. As a family, we see that overnight, suddenly everything changed. We see an experience of broken down relationships. We see uh, financial turmoil. We see feelings of insecurity, uh, unsafe uh, situations. Their livelihood suddenly overnight turns around. And it feels like their whole world is crashing down. You know, I, when I was watching that drama, those are the things that really, really stuck to me. And, and towards the end of the drama, the main character, Tao Kei Wong, he says this phrase that really caught my attention. He says in this one-liner, which carries a powerful message. He says, I will hold on to Tao Kei Wei's words and trust God. You know, maybe for all we know, it's God who sends Tao Kei Wei to help us out in our time of need. It is God that we can trust. And in this one-liner, it carries a powerful message for us. It is, I believe, the ultimate reason for this Christmas season. You know, for the Christian faith, Christmas is about the birth of Jesus. But more than the birth of Jesus, it is significant because it carries hope. In this Jesus, we can trust. And because of that, there is hope for us today. So this morning, I want to share with us in a few moments uh, this message, this Christmas message on hope. That hope is here. Hope is here this Christmas. You know, if you're visiting for the very first time, I believe that this message is a message that you can identify and can relate. But even maybe if you're a better night, maybe if you are a, a long-time Christian, I believe this message as well has place in your heart this morning. See, hope is here and Jesus being born is the arrival of hope. And how does Jesus being born? Born brings hope. He does it by giving a message of good news and by saving humanity. Right now, we're going to look into the Bible, into the Gospel of Luke. And in this story, we will see the birth of Jesus. We will see this message of hope come through. Uh, we're going to turn to our Bible in Luke chapter 2, verse 6 to 14. And before we read this passage, I just want to set the scene the scene right now in this story is that Joseph and Mary are on the way to Bethlehem to take this census that is initiated by the Roman government at that time. So on the way to Bethlehem, Mary now is with child and she is conceived and Jesus is conceived in, in, in Mary to the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they are on their way to Bethlehem right now. And so when we read in Luke chapter 2 verse 6, we are seeing this story come to pass. So uh, let's read it together. Luke 2 uh, verses 6 to 14, it says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest rooms available for them. And there were shepherds living in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior is, has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven 
and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Wow, what a... Check. Oh, sorry. What a powerful message and story here. See, how Jesus' birth brings hope is by giving a message of good news. In that verse that we read, we see the angel of the Lord appeared to them, them being the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone upon them. And what did the angel say? The angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. And so why is it good news? Good news because it is a prophecy being fulfilled. See, the people of God at this time, they were living in a state of oppression and captivity. For the longest time, the Jews and this Israel and the people of God have always been living in captivity. Uh, right now, in this story we're reading, look, it's the Roman Empire. But prior to the Roman Empire, it was the Babylonians. Prior to the Babylonians, it was the Assyrians. And so the people of God had lost their identity. And so God would speak to many people prophets throughout history to give this message of hope that there will come a time where God would redeem the nation. There will come a time where God would send a Messiah, a Savior to redeem the people of God. There will come a time where the people of God will repent and turn back to God and God would bring in a new era. And so Jesus being born is actually good news because it's a prophecy fulfilled. It's a prophecy fulfilled. You know, the prophet Isaiah spoke about Jesus' birth. And this was 700 years before the birth of Jesus in Luke 2. So that means 700, 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah spoke of this Jesus. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is a prophecy about the coming Jesus who would come 700 years later. See, it's good news not just because a baby is being born, but it's a good news because there's a prophecy being fulfilled. Another reason why it's good news because it's what the people have been anticipating for. You know, the people of God in this context were waiting for the Messiah to come. And the Messiah would be this person who would redeem the people, who would call all the people back to God. It would be a day where the Messiah would set everything right. It would be a day where God would save His people and redeem them and call them to their own. But also it would be a day where the Savior will reunite the people of God back to God. See, it's good news because people were hoping and anticipating for this coming Messiah. You know, as I was reading this passage of Scripture, I was reading it again, I was preparing for today, a, a common thought came into my mind. And maybe for some of you who are familiar with the, the nativity birth scene and everything, have you ever thought and asked yourself, why did God speak to the shepherds? You know, so that was a thought in my mind. If I have good news... If I have news that will save the world, wow, I have this pill that will like, wow, if I have this splitzer drink that will give an outer body experience, if I have this good news, right, and I want to share it, who would I share it with? I would share it with people of influence. I would share it with people of power, right? People who are maybe celebrities. Wow, David Beckham endorsed my splitzer drink. You know, that's very powerful, right? But somehow this good news of the Savior came to the shepherds. Have you ever wondered why the shepherds? Of all people, why the shepherds? So as I was researching, this Bible scholar kind of illuminated my mind because he said the reason why God chose the shepherds is because it's a message for everyone. Not just for the elite, not just for the influential, but for everyone. God chose to announce Christ's arrival to the shepherds because God wants to show His great love for everyone. You know, shepherds at this time weren't just humble, uh, good people. 
shepherds at that time were considered a lower class. Shepherds at that time were, were kind of considered, uh, look, they were looked down upon. These were people who do menial tasks. All they did was care for the sheep and prepare the sheep and bring the sheep for the altar sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. And so a lot of times people would look at shepherds, uh, not, in, not in a say that they're terrible people, but not to say that they're great people, right? They would look, consider them uneducated. They were low class in the society. But God would use them. Because this message is for everyone. And the twofold reason for this also is because it's a prophetic declaration. You know, the Bible scholar Alfred Eidersheim, he says this, he believed that God had a divine purpose for announcing Christ's coming to the shepherd. And he has this quote, he said that these men, the shepherds, these men who watched the sheep meant for slaughter received an ultimate divine message about the ultimate lamb who would take away the sins of the world through his death and resurrection. That is in reference to Jesus. See, it is a prophetic declaration because it's a foreshadowing of Jesus. That this baby being born, Jesus the Christ, he would eventually live his life and become the ultimate lamb to take away the sins of the world. See, the people of God would need a lamb and they would sacrifice that for the forgiveness of sin. But with Jesus coming, he becomes this perfect lamb who would take away the sins of the world. Jesus being born brings a hope of good news because it means that God is fulfilling his promise to, to redeem his people, to call people, but also because it's a good news of salvation. It's a good news that God is here to redeem us, to reunite us with God. See, my second point today is that Jesus brings, Jesus' arrival brings hope of good news, but also that Jesus' arrival brings hope by saving humanity. You know, in the Bible, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, it, 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 uh, it tells the birth of Jesus, and in Matthew 1, 22, uh, 21 to 23, it says that she will give birth to a son. And you want to give him the name Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus' arrival brings hope by saving humanity. You know, the very first thing is that actually we are dead in our sins. We are dead in our sins. In Time magazine, a long time ago, they interviewed this English writer, author, philosopher. He's an art and literary critic. He goes by the name of G.K. Chesterton. And in Time's magazine, they interviewed him. They wanted his perspective on, on the current state of the world. And so they asked him this question. They said, hey, what is wrong with the world today? And G.K. Chesterton, in his uh, profoundness and prolificness, he replied to them, he said, Dear sirs, what's wrong with the world today? Is I am. Yours faithfully, G.K. Chesterton. I am. And what he was trying to allude to this article writer in Times Magazine is that Actually, I am wrong with the world today. The humans are, uh, are wrong in a sense with the world today because we are broken. And that speaks of our current state, our, our sinful state. That not one of us is perfect. We can try to be as righteous as we can. We can try to do as many good things that we as we can, but deep down when we look at ourselves, actually not one of us is righteous. Not one of us is without blemish. It speaks of our current state. You know, and the Bible tells us that in the Genesis story, the creation story, that in Genesis 3, through, through the sin of Adam, the whole race, the whole humankind, all of creation has been tainted by sin. Through the sin of one man, we have been separated from God. That we need to be reunited with God. 
that God created us to be in union and communion with Him, but because of sin, that separates us. You know, in the book of Romans, it says, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so why is this good news? Because Jesus has come to save us from our sins. It's found in His name. Jesus the Christ. The word the Christ actually means the anointed one. In Hebrew, it means Messiah. The one who will save us from our sins. Jesus saves humanity by saving us from our sins, but He also does this by stepping into our world. In Philippians 2, 6 to 8, it says about this, about Jesus. He says, Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equally with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and even death to the cross. Scripture shows us that Jesus is fully God and fully man, and he experienced the same hardships that you and I experience. He came as a servant and humbled himself even to the point of death. He took on our weakness. See, Jesus being born brings hope by saving us. He's redeeming, calling all of creation to his own. Because of Jesus' work, we now have direct access to God. He redeems us. And because of that, there is hope. There is hope. You know, I was, when I was preparing this, I'm reminded by the drama that we just watched. You know, there's a lot of relevance that we can take from. You know, broken down relationships, strained father-son relationships. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of anger. Um, family hardships, uh, sadness, grief, uh, getting scammed, a lot of mischief, a lot of evil, right? Financial turmoil, you know, experience of physical, mental stress. Uh, and that leads us to a place of insecurity. It leads us to a place of stress, tension, uh, sometimes even a mental breakdown because of this. And these are things that we can relate. And maybe for some of us in the room or for some of us who are watching online, hey, these are things that are familiar. You know, we heard, maybe we know of a family or someone who went through a similar state. Maybe we know of people in our life who experience what they experience. Or maybe if we are honest with ourselves, maybe some of us in this room have gone through these experiences too. The truth is that we can find hope in God. You know, when I was looking at a bigger picture, right, this is actually the world that we are living in. You know, a statistic says that 49% of U.S. households had suffered a decline in income throughout this coronavirus pandemic. The, the most common way uh, people have lost their income is actually through layoffs and furloughs, right? And a study done in Malaysia, in Malaysia are, um, around low household income, they, they, they find that the results show that 31% of these 31 people have battled with moderate depression. 40% have a severe depression, right? 50% of families who are struggling economically and going through this area, 15% uh, 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 of them struggle with moderate anxiety, 16% severe anxiety. So the results show that these issues are quite relevant. But the truth is this, like this drama production, the point I'm trying to make is that when we trust in God, no matter what happens, He will see us true. And that is the hope of Christmas. That is the hope of Christmas. I'm reminded by this story, and I came across this story as I was preparing for this message, and I believe this story kind of illustrates um, the hope that we can have with God and how God gives us hope in a time of endurance. You know, in the Olympics in 1992 in Barcelona, there was, a, uh, there was this famous uh, runner by the name of Derek Redmond. So Derek Redmond is from Britain. 
and he has dreamed of winning the gold medal at this Olympic uh, event in Barcelona in 1992. And his dream was in sight because he made it to the semifinals. And so he was running the race of his life, and at the gunshot went off, he ran off as fast as he could. And he was making good time, and all he had was the back turn and the finish line, the full stretch, and then he gets the gold. As he approaches that back turn, suddenly he falls face first to the ground. As he falls face first to the ground, you know, the, in a post, uh, post-race interview, he said that when he fell face first to the ground, he felt a sharp pain shoot down his right leg. And what they realized is that he actually had torn his hamstring. Literally torn his hamstring. And so in the spur of the moment, as he makes that turn, he tries to run, he tosses his hamstring, he falls face to the ground. In the moment, the medics try to rush to him. But in that moment, he decided to pick himself up. He said that it's almost like animal instinct. I decided to pick myself up and, and get whatever energy. And, and he was hopping and limping and struggling and trying to make uh, his attempt to finish the race. When out of the corner of his eye, this man from the stands comes rushing over. This huge man in a t-shirt comes rushing over to him. And he couldn't even, he wasn't even know who this man is at that time. And this man pushed off the security, the medical team, and he came to him. And lo and behold, this man is Jim Redman. And that is his father, Derek's father. And so both of them are in the track and he tells his son, son, you don't need to do this. Both of them are weeping, are crying, are filled with pain and anxiety and stress. All his dreams of winning the gold medal is going down the drain. And he tells his son, son, you don't need to do this. It's okay. And both of them go back and forth. But Derek tells his father, no, I need to finish this race. And the father's response to him was, well then, let's do it together. And so they finish that whole race, they come across that turn and they finish that stretch together. Derek is still in his lane and the whole crowd stands in awe. They gasp, some are crying, some are uh, 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 thinking, how could this happen? He finished the race and in the post-match interview, he said, I didn't win the gold medal. I wanted to. And it would be amazing uh, if in his story if he won the gold medal, right? It would be an amazing story. But in that, in that post-race match interview, he said, I didn't win the gold medal, but I saw the love of my father, that he was with me in my pain and suffering. See, the hope of Christmas is actually found in this Olympic story because Jesus brings hope in this similar manner. The world to our world brings a hope that He is with us, that God is with us. When we're experiencing pain and struggling to finish the race, we can be confident He is with us, that He left His place in heaven to come alongside us in the person of Jesus. And this Jesus, like the scripture we read, is with us. The reason and the truth for the Christian faith is found actually in this drama production, Joy to the Wongs, that ultimately Jesus brings us hope. And that is why Christmas is of infinite significance for the Christian faith. Because Jesus' arrival is of hope. It doesn't mean that our lives are uh, uh, happy-go-lucky, everything is rainbow and butterflies, everything will be okay. I don't think Jesus promises that. But what does Jesus promise is that he will be with you in every circumstance. And that's why Christmas, hope is here. Hope is here. In essence, Jesus comes into the world to save us. We were dead in our sin. And so God loved us so much that he sent his son. He sent his son 
and his son would be born supernaturally to a virgin birth, virgin birth, and he is of God, he's divine, and he would be born, and he's fully God and fully man, and he would grow up to, to do great things. He would do great teachings, miracles, and ultimately he would give up his life. He would give up his life and sacrifice life so that we can have abundant life. But death wouldn't hold him down. He would rise up again because he is God. He would conquer death and through his conquering of death, he would give us a pathway towards God. So for us today, whether you're a Christian, whether you're not a Christian, whether you're a follower of Christ or whether you're not, we can put our faith in Jesus because he gives us life and we can have this hope in our hearts. At this moment, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. Today, this morning, this Christmas day, as we celebrate Christmas, for those who are watching online and for those who are here on site, I want to give us an opportunity to respond. I think Christmas is a great time to respond to God. You know, in a few moments' time, I, I, I want to give us a time to, uh, give us a, a, a moment to respond for two groups of people, right? And for the first group, maybe you've heard of Jesus, right? Uh, or maybe you completely never heard of Jesus before. Maybe you have a, a Christian colleague at work, or maybe you've been invited to church a few times, but you've never really made Jesus the Lord of your life. Or maybe today you're here with a family and a friend and someone invited you, but you're always curious about who is this Jesus. Today is an opportunity for you to respond to God this morning. So in a few moments time, I will invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you want to make Jesus this Lord over your life, I will invite you to raise your hand. Right? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, you will be saved. And you can have this hope in your hearts. This hope that we sing about, that we pray about, that we, we, we rejoice over. So in a few moments time, I will invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And why we do that is because this moment is a holy moment. It's a moment between you and God with no distractions aside. And if you want to receive this Jesus into your life, I will invite you to raise your hand. So right now, with everyone's eyes closed, everyone's head bowed, no one looking around, no one being distracted between you and God. If you want to receive this Jesus, this hope that we've been singing about and, and praying about and preaching about, I want to give you this opportunity. I want to give you this time and space to respond to God. At the count of three, I will invite you to raise your hand. And if you want to receive this Jesus, I want you to just lift up your hands. No one looking around, just between you and God. You know, today is a day that we can respond to God, even for those online. One, two, three. Right now, if you want to respond to God, go ahead. If you want to give your life to Jesus, just begin to lift your hand. Just between you and God, just begin to lift your hand. And hey, if you're watching online, you want to give your heart to Jesus, go ahead and type it in the chat. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Right now, I'm going to lead us into a prayer. And so for all of us who are watching online and, in, and on site right now, go ahead and repeat this prayer after me. And I want to encourage you that if you believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth, Jesus will come into your life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I have acknowledged that I'm a sinner and I need you to forgive me of my sins. 
I acknowledge that you died on the cross for me. That you came into the world to save me. So today, I invite you into my life. Come and be my personal Lord and Savior. This morning, I give my life to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I commit my life to you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you said that prayer, let's rejoice together. That is a wonderful prayer. The second group of people that I want to give a time to respond is maybe for some of us who are Christians. We identify in the Christian faith. We have followed Jesus. But after celebrating Christmas today, maybe when we take stock of our life, we realize that maybe we are far away from God. Today, I want to give you this opportunity to rededicate your life back to God. You know, the great thing about Jesus is that we can always run back to Him. So one more time with everyone's eyes closed and heads bowed, if you want to rededicate your life back to God, if you want to come back to Him, if you want to forsake your old way of living and come back to God, I want you to respond today. So at the count of three, if you want to respond to God and rededicate your life, I want you to raise up your hand. One, two, three. If you want to rededicate your life, if you want to come back to God, thank you, I see that hand. Anyone else, today is a day to respond to God. Thank you for that hand. We're going to pray right now and in the same manner, repeat after me and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for abandoning the godly life. This Christmas, I want to come back to you. I know that you are calling me back into relationship with you. So this Christmas, Lord, I want to return to you. I commit my life wholly to Jesus Christ once again. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I am yours and you are mine. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Hey, let's stand to our feet and let's celebrate for all those who said that prayer, for all those who gave, uh, uh, rededicated their life. Let's celebrate big right now. Let's put our hands together for all those who gave their life to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right now, we have come to the end of our service, but we want to end off with this song and bring in the Christmas cheer. Worship team, take it away. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad. Come on, we sing. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, Prospero Año y Felicidad. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. When we sing, uh, we want to wish Navidad. you a Merry Christmas time. Let's walk around, let's go around, Feliz wish Navidad. each other a uh, Merry Christmas. Felicidad. Come on, let's go around. We want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. 
wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. We want to wish. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. Hey church, we have come to the end of our service and we just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas this Sunday morning.